board. All right, so welcome everyone. We are, um, we're lucky to have a kind of international panel today, um, but I am coming from Wurundjeri country, um, the unceded land of the uh, Kulin nations. And I wanna pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging and extend that respect to all um, Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders across Australia. So um, I'm just gonna briefly um, mention who's presenting, um, but not get too deep into bios or abstracts. Uh, we will start off with Ignacio Berrios, who's coming to us from uh, Universidad Pontifica Comillas in Madrid. And then we will uh, see Charlie Hewson um, presenting as well, who's coming from Université de Paris. Um, oh, I should mention actually Ignacio's presentation is called Truman Meets Climate Change, The Delusion of a Media Life in the Anthropocene. And the next presentation by Charlie is Invisible Threats and Materialist Visibility, Degradations and Quiet Zone. And then our last presentation of this session is by Brett Mills, who is coming to us from Edge Hill University in the UK. And his presentation is titled Jaws from the Shark's Point of View. So I will um, let Ignacio get us started here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and congratulations for the conference. It's my first time uh, from, from Spain on an online conference and um, I'm enjoying all the, the presentations very much. So thank you for, for that. Um, let me quickly share my presentation. Okay. Okay, so actually I'm in uh, Mallorca in, in an island uh, next to the Iberian Peninsula in, uh, in Europe, here in Spain. Um, and I'm presenting, um, uh, well, it's a first reflection on a, of, of, a, of a small project called Media Life in the Anthropocene, which deals with uh, the um, close interrelation of two trends uh, of, of contemporary uh, societies. Uh, first, the importance or, or the key role of media in our, in our lives, and also the impact or the influence that, uh, that, that, that humans uh, are having on the, on the um, planetary ecosystems and what has been called the Anthropocene or the supposed uh, human uh, epoch. Um, so uh, this is a small project that I am just starting and I am, this will be a more uh, theoretical approach and I am using the approach of Ecomedia, which uh, I have been uh, studying recently to explain some, uh, some ideas that uh, I think that in this case, the film, The Truman Show, uh, helps us to explain uh, in relationship to, to these two trends and the interrelationship of these two trends. Um, so um, one key aspect of these two, of, of these, of, of the media life and, and the Anthropocene is that today it seems that we are the uh, protagonists of, 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 a, of, a media, of a media life and at the same time we are also the protagonists of, of, the, of the changing ecosystems and the also um, that may, may be responsible for, for um, uh, climate change. And that, that uh, gives us a, also an idea on the, maybe the relationship between media and uh, nature. And uh, this is why I'm, I'm uh, focusing on, 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 on uh, Peter Weir's uh, film, uh, Truman Show. As you may know, uh, this is a film uh, from 1998, where uh, Jim Carrey plays uh, Truman Burbank, who, um, who is the protagonist of a reality show. Um, and, and he spends his whole life living in a staged uh, studio, in a, in a set, in a staged uh, reality show that's being watched by millions of people. Um, 
in his in this set, uh, his world is characterized by pervasive and ubiquitous uh, media, uh, invisible media, invisible technologies that follow his uh, steps um, during uh, 24 hours. And uh, his life is being constantly monitored and recorded. This film has been used to talk about uh, free will, the relationship between God and man, the uh, importance of popular culture in, in today's societies, also the growing, import, um, yeah, the, the growing impact of reality TV in, in today's societies. Uh, but also in how every aspect of our life can can be or plays out in in, in media somehow. Um, the 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 basic in, in the film the basic premise uh, is based um, or, or we can say that uh, Truman is convinced of this uh, real life under the premise presented by Christoph, who is the director of the of the show, and he explains that we accept the reality of the world. As we, as it is presented uh, to us, uh, and the, that idea, um, you can also see that it's not only um, the, the, the the staged uh, world of 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 of, Truman, of the Truman Show, but also the influence that um, posters, radio shows, television, or advertising, or uh, newspapers have. On the on, on life of, of Truman and his uh, worldviews and and also the way that he uh, behaves and the fears he has etc. Um, this is, of course relates a lot to um, or, or to some aspects of, of our current societies. If we uh, consider um, Mark Doyce's theory of the media life. Um, for Mark uh, Doyce, he in, in his book Media Life, he uh, explains that um, media are to us what uh, fish, uh, what water is to fish somehow. And uh, in a nutshell, he explains that we do not live with media, we live in media, and that media are pervasive and ubiquitous, and, and that we cannot explain, um, we cannot escape from that from that reality. In that sense, he also um, um, reflects on the Truman Show, and and he says that the Truman Show metaphor is perhaps appropriate in so far as it addresses ple uh, people's complex, interconnected yet often solipsistic engagement with reality in in media, and, and um, regarding regarding um, also the, the reality of the, of the world. He explains that Truman's world uh, might not be uh, unreal, but rather it is real in so far as the protagonist is not aware of being on camera at all times. Um, on the other side, uh, I'm interested in how uh, technologies uh, today are also having a huge impact on uh, our planet and on different levels on the ecosystems and how uh, in, the, in the broader um, debate on the Anthropocene, how social sciences and humanities can also make some, um, um, yeah, some, some, some uh, insights, yeah, give some insights to the, to the debate. Um, in that sense, um, um, Technology, as Arias Maldonado explains, technology and, and the relationships with nature and among uh, humans are um, growing, are more and more mediated by technology. And um, so that uh, technology and media are also a key factor in this uh, influence. Now, how can we um, um, interpret from, from uh, um, the Truman Show the um, influence of or how these um, theories from media life and, and, and the med mediation or, or the growing um, media influence in, in the Anthropocene, how can they interrelate in uh, the Truman Show? The, in, the, in this scene, um, Truman is um, still not aware of his uh, situation, but, um, but he is, um, more and more interested in knowing what is going on um, in in the real world or in the outer world, and, and not in his in his uh, village where he has lived all his life. And we can see how suddenly rain seems to 
Um, it's it's not working uh, properly. So the the we can see that the control room did have uh, have uh, some problems in the with the with the rain in the in the show. But he uh, did not. Um, he was he wasn't aware of of that. Um, of that error, and and he, but but and he experienced it as a as a as a something natural or something that um, that made him. It was joy joyful for him, but uh, more and more he was being aware that he is he was having some kind of different experience, and, and this leads to, uh, further in the in the movie to him going. Uh, on a ship and looking for what's going, what this um, uh, further away in in uh, in the sea. Let's see uh, this uh, scene where you can see how Sorry. Oh, sorry, that was a, a mistake. Um, in this scene, which is uh, towards the end of the of the film, he uh, is he is more aware of of uh, you can say the the um, strange experiences that he is having in his life and how the how nature is behaving in strange ways. Um, and he, without knowing who is uh, he talking to, he says, "You have to kill me if you if you want me to stop." Um, in the end, uh, we we can see how um, he in, in the control room we can see how um, Christophe or the, the director wants uh, wants him to stop, and and he controls the set, controls the artificial nature or the artificial ecosystem of the of the set through through technology in order him to stop um, on a side note it's interesting to see how this is um, represented in the film we can see here uh, Paul Giamatti which on a side note is interestingly has also played this similar role in other films um, in, in paycheck for instance he also manipulated um, ben Affleck's um, brain, or more recently in San Andreas, he also um, anticipated uh, earthquakes using technology or or mediated uh, media sensors and, and technology. Um, but going back to to um, to the Truman Show, you can see how um, the depiction or the representation of human alteration of nature um, starts to also uh, include some um, some uh, images and some uh, representations that um, might also have an influence on how we understand and how we understand the dangers of climate change or the dangers of of uh, human activity on on climate. Um, in the final scene of 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 uh, the Truman Show, you, we can see how he. Uh, finally gets to the limit of the set and he um, and he discovers the truth which is basically that uh, he is on a on a TV show on a reality show
Um, I think that, that this uh, scene gives us some inputs or might help us to make sense of, of the role of our media life in the Anthropocene if we, um, if we consider that maybe in this moment, Truman becomes uh, what Aris Maldonado has called the post-sovereign uh, subject, who is an individual who is no longer acknowledged as a fully rational agent capable of informed decisions and preferences. And on the contrary, he, she is affected by a, a bias and constraints, in this case, uh, the set, uh, that until then he is not aware. By gaining awareness of such limitations, um, he gains some um, sovereignty by realizing that uh, her decisions uh, and preferences are not the product of an unmediated process of rational thinking. In uh, Deuce's, uh, Deuce's uh, words, this is the paradox of being aware that the same media that shape our knowledge about society um, and build up our uh, reality can also be constructed or manipulated, which is uh, basically what Truman uh, discovers in this, in this part. Um, and I'm going to finish uh, very quickly. Um, I think that uh, we have to acknowledge the close interrelation between uh, human and nature and human and media. That there is no way back um, uh, in these processes. Um, these are irreversible and unpredictable processes, both the Anthropocene and the influence of technology in, in our lives. And um, I think that the, the, the idea of what's next or how can we continue a conversation on how to live a media life in the Anthropocene comes not with the ending of the film, but rather imagining what would happen uh, if Truman in the end of the film did not escape or did not go away from the set. It's basically what Jenkins in 2004 um, asked uh, is he so or he he considered that it never occurs that anyone um to anyone that truman might stay on the air generating his own content and delivering his own message which is basically what also um mark davis uh, Deus, uh, uh, says in his media life book um when we navigate our ocean of media to what we think will be the door leading beyond the studio there is no exit. We will see a sign, and on the sign it will say the, uh, the words, this is not an exit. So I think that maybe um, Truman can show us a way of how, um, uh, how to start thinking about uh, a life within uh, a media life and, um, and how uh, also in, in, a, in, a, in a planet that's being affected by our own actions. Um, sorry for, I don't know if the time has been too much, but uh, thank you again. And um... Great. Thank you, Ignacio. Yes. That was excellent. Um, so everyone, please save your questions for the very end, and we'll spend the last minutes kind of having a Q&A with all the presenters. Um, so up next is Charlie. And, you know, I neglected to ask as well if you prefer a two minute warning in the chat, or if you want me to make some kind of noise at two minutes, um, just let me know what you'd prefer. Uh, I guess, I, have, I mean, often when when the when we have to share the, the screen, it's difficult to see it's the discussion. See. So if you make it, Okay, yeah. I'll make a little sound at two minutes till. Perfect. Uh, all right, I'll try and share the screen. that visible? Yes. Okay. Uh, all right, well, hello everyone and thank you for uh, allowing me to be a part of this uh, uh, conference. So more often than not, the, the effects, dangers and threats of climate change have been depicted cinematically in terms of uh, the hyper-visible event. Tsunamis, ecological devastation shown through awe-inspiring uh, time-lapse or aerial footage, storms wreaking havoc, blistering and squint-inducing bright heat or blue-tinted icy cold. This is true both 
in uh, <coughs> in blockbuster films like 2012 or Day After Tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. But also uh, we can see a similar effect in more politically engaged message films like those uploaded to YouTube by organizations such as uh, Extinction Rebellion. In the wake of the last few years, what with the fires in Australia, Greece, California, uh, storms and earthquakes in, in Haiti and, and other places and so on, these of course are not fundamentally false representations of the dangers we are facing, though blockbuster films obviously have a tendency to, of course, exaggerate them in order to amp up the spectacle. However, if the last year and a half dealing with the coronavirus pandemic has reminded us of anything, uh, it's that we are facing at least as many threats and disasters uh, which are not so easily represented in the form of hyper-visible events. Rather, climate disaster is also present in more insidious ways in the form of invisible threats that are no less devastating. While this is perhaps the first of such uh, invisible threats that, ha uh, that has taken on such a global scale and that has affected the human population in such a direct way, the idea of impending ecological disaster as being something that is not immediately visible is not a new one. Indeed, one of the first texts credited with raising an ecological consciousness in uh, the general population, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in 1962, talks of the threat, and she's talking specifically of insecticides, uh, she talks of ecological threat as a silent and invisible killer. The shadow of death, uh, the strange stillness, or the grim specter. Others like Rob Nixon more recently have talked about uh, having to take into account slow violence, that violence that is wreaked by ecological disaster that can't be apprehended in the same way as bodies falling from buildings, explosions, volcanoes erupting, or cities uh, being decimated. Timothy Morden uh, similarly talks of hyper objects, those objects and or threats that are too massively dispersed in time and space to be immediately visible or apprehended. These uh, thinkers all point to, to this idea that we have to take into account the non the dangers and forces that aren't easily translated into the immediately visible event that would be contained in a precise time and place uh, or easily identifiable uh, with bodies or entities. This virus, to some extent, or at least the way that it spreads and affects us, is an example of one of these threats. Uh, one that is difficult to translate into a hyper-visible spectacle or easily representable uh, entity. It's no wonder then uh, that even one and a half years after the beginning of the pandemic, there are still those who refuse to believe it actually exists or uh, refuse to believe that it's something to be afraid of or something that we need to modulate our behavior around. If I can't see it, does it really exist? This therefore poses uh, a properly cinematic question. How do you represent the unrepresentable? Or perhaps more radically, is representation itself as a paradigm for knowledge up to the task when faced with the problems posed by ecological uh, disaster. It's a difficult question and there are not many films or audiovisual works that I know of yet, perhaps, that take on this question in regard specifically to COVID. However, I want to propose that there are some film practices that can perhaps serve as models or at the very least point to interesting ways of thinking through uh, the problem as it's posed. So I'm going to talk about two examples here, both photochemical or analog experimental films made in the last 15 years. The first uh, is a film called Degradation Number no. One X-Ray Part Two, Government Radiation, by an American filmmaker, uh, James June Schneider, and the film made in, in 2007. So in order to make this film, Schneider uh, filmed the American Capitol building that we can see uh, on the left, uh, in Washington, D.C. from a little distance, uh, the locked off static shot. 
on about 30 meters, for about 30 meters uh, or 100 feet of 16 millimeter film. That comes to around two minutes, 45 uh, seconds of footage. Then this footage was cut into six or seven uh, equal pieces. And each piece was then passed through uh, government security machines, uh, government security x-ray machines, uh, a different number of times. So the first section that we can see on the, uh, the top left was passed not at all. And then each section was, was passed four, eight, 16, 32, 64, or 128 times. Now, the result when you watch the short film, and it's uh, available on Vimeo in the link uh, that's on the, on the screen, uh, is a gradual effacement of the original image. The last section uh, that's, that was passed through 128 times uh, is what we can, is, you know, we can see an image of the bottom left, uh, bottom right, sorry. Uh, it ends up being almost entirely white just with the faint golden sort of silhouette of the Capitol building, uh, just barely visible. So here the implication uh, is quite clear that the rays of the X-ray machine, uh, X-ray security machine have affected the emulsion of the film stock uh, in such a way as to gradually efface uh, or make disappear any semblance of figure that was there before. The second example uh, is a more recent film. Uh, from 2014, uh, called Quiet Zone by Canadian filmmakers and musicians Carl Lemieux and David Bryant. Now, this film specifically documentary, uh, or has a more specific do documentary subject. Uh, it is about a, is a film about a group of women who have what's called electromagnetic sensibility, uh, hypersensitivity. Sorry, that is, they are allergic in a sense to the presence of electromagnetic fields. Thus, they can't live in everyday modern society as the omnipresence of electronic devices, whether they be electric lights, TVs, phones, etc., causes them actual physical pain. So a group of them, uh, a group of these women have moved uh, to a place in West Virginia in the States uh, called the National Radio Quiet Zone, where uh, a specific place in America where in order to uh, facilitate scientific research and the gathering of military intelligence, nothing uh, is allowed in the area that generates radio or electromagnetic waves. So this film uh, is made up of interviews with the women who describe uh, their situation, describe their disease, uh, and we hear their voices talking over images of landscapes uh, some images of towns uh, and various shots of the room. Uh, examples of the kinds of images uh, you see in the film uh, on, on screen. And as you see, as you can see, these images are perturbed uh, by flickering stains, what seem like sort of grainy tears in the image or uh, almost tumors or wavy bumps that distort the surface uh, of the image. These disturbances seem to try and make palpable the suffering that these women feel caused by electromagnetic waves, uh, giving the audience a visual and sensorial clue uh, as to the distortion that this particular syndrome creates in the way that these women interact with the world. Coupled with the eerie music, the filmmakers seem to make us want to empathize, uh, or seem to want to make us, sorry, uh, empathize with those talking. Uh, make us feel their pain and discomfort through these distorted uh, worldviews. So in a similar way to Schneider's film, uh, Quiet Zone shows figurative images being effaced or affected uh, by forces that are usually invisible, like X-rays or electromagnetic waves. The recognizable shapes and forms are affected in such a way as to risk becoming entirely unrecognizable or becoming impossible to distinguish. The difference, obviously, between the two films is that while the image of the Capitol building gradually disappears because of the action of the X-rays themselves, the effects in Quiet Zone come from the actions of the filmmakers who employed various photochemical techniques to create them. They used techniques such as massage, bleaching, over-oxidization, solarization, etc., in order to create these effects, uh, which are then used as stand-ins for the way uh, that the women feel in the film. 
Now, neither of these films, of course, are specifically about the coronavirus. Or the coronavirus emerged. Uh, they are, however, about similarly invisible ecological effects, unseen forces that can wreak havoc on human bodies. In a certain sense, the radioactivity, electromagnetic forces, or the coronavirus can all three be seen uh, as manifestations of the virus in the sense that Elizabeth Povinelli gives to this term in her book, Geontology's the Requiem to Late Liberalism. The virus is one of the three figures with the desert and the animist that Elizabeth Pavanelli describes as being symptomatic of the ways in which our late liberal mode of governance, she calls Gionto power, is fragilized. It refers to these often invisible forces which disrupt political arrangements that are held up as natural, such as the difference between life and non-life, <coughs> since it ignores these forms of differentiation. As Pavanelli says, in an echo of Michel Serre's writings on uh, the parasite, it is the antagonistic agent built out of collective assemblage that is late liberal geontopa, end quote. That is, it is the remainder of the distributions of life uh, in liberal geontopa. It's, it's forces that these assemblages, uh, it, sorry, it forces these assemblages constantly rearrange themselves in its wake. Think of the terrorist, for example, another figure of the virus, and the way that in the last few decades, uh, we have been forced as a society to change our modes of governance uh, around the figure, or obviously the way in the last year or, and a bit, the way coronavirus has upended our collective lives over this last year and a bit. Sort of in this way, the X-rays that manifest themselves in Snyder's films, or the electromagnetic interference that is the subject of the Mew and the Bryant's film, uh, are to be apprehended as similar parasitic ecological forces, invisible and inaudible noise, which nonetheless has the power to disrupt the very distinctions that we base our modes of governments and our way of living in the world. What's interesting about these films, however, is they don't rely solely on representation as a way to make these invisible films. To understand the meaning of the images, the distortion or the effacement of the figures, both films need a certain explanation of the process behind them. We can only understand the image of degradation, Schneider's film, because we know what happened to the film stock that Schneider used. In a slightly different way to fully gauge the impact of quiet zone, we have to have an understanding that this distortion is not simply after effects that are added on to, a, to, a, to, to the surface, but post-production techniques that affect the emulsion in its very materiality. Both films then integrate the material process of the image formation or deformation into the very act of seeing and comprehending the image, thus forcing us to see the film stock as a material entity being affected by that with which it comes in contact. And this isn't the same as making visible in the normal representational cinematic sense. I, as the spectator, am not seeing something through the eyes of a camera represented on screen in a way that demands us to think in terms of the relation between various pre-established entities, the viewer, the observed, etc. Instead, it proposes something perhaps closer to what Karen Berard calls a post-humanist performative approach, directly opposed to a representationalist approach. That is an approach that, and I quote, focuses inquiry on the practices or performances of rep representing, as well as on the productive effects of those practices and the conditions for their efficacy. In the context of trying to apprehend cinemat cinematically these invisible threats, viruses, parasites, of which the coronavirus is the latest, but will probably not be the last, these materialist films then seem to propose the possibility of redefining uh, what we mean by becoming visible. It is not simply adjusting our eyes to take, to take in a bigger picture, stepping back for a broader or more precise view, thereby bringing new things into focus that we could not see before. Instead, both films 
engage materially with the invisible processes that make up the world around them. They force the viewers to take into account the way these processes disrupt that which seems obvious because easily representable. And they present the effects that this integrated integration of material process has on the production or the destruction of a certain form of visibility. That is, they posit vis visibility as its own specific form of material assemblage or process of production. And in a sense, they hint at new ways, perhaps, to use media as a way to engage with the world around us, not by turning it into a spectacle that distinguishes between that which is humanly visible and that which is not, but rather invites us, uh, I'll almost finish, uh, rather it invites us to shed representation as a paradigm powerless against the high project, the parasite or the virus that's around us, and rather focus on processes and becomings, what multiple, effect, multiple effects they produce, and the way that this new focus can disrupt our ways uh, of existing in the world. Thank you. Great, excellent. Thank you for that, Charlie. Okay, I'd like to now invite our last presenter up. Um, so we have Brett Mills. Hello. Hello. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks, Rebecca, and thanks to the uh, organizers of the conference. Um, because my paper's got quite a lot of media stuff in it, I've pre recorded it. So there should be a YouTube link in the chat. Uh, if you all want to go and watch that, we can come back in 15 minutes and, and, and I'll see you all here. Perfect. Thanks.
Okay. I expect most of you have finished watching Brett's powerful presentation. Um, and if everybody wants to head back for the last six, five, six minutes of QA um, for either Brett, Charlie, or Ignacio. And um, I'll pause here for a minute and see if there's any um, hands that go up or if people want to put any comments um, or questions in the chat, we can do it that way as well. Might just make a couple of comments as people start kind of formulating what they might wanna ask or say. Um, I'm just thinking about the the sort of tie between Ignacio and Charlie's presentations with this idea of kind of what we're able to see and therefore know. And there's there seems to be some kind of overlap with that idea. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily a question, but more of sort of an observation um, that I was noticing between the two. Um, and and just sort of thinking a bit about Ignacio's, um, I started to also think about how um, the Truman Show also um, in a weird way seems to kind of point toward this like geoengineering <laughs> as well. And it's sort of, it's it's this, it's a sign of that on some level. Um, it just occurred to me that um, that might be the case. I don't know if you um, agree or not, but um, do you have any quick thoughts on that? Um, well, yes. I mean, uh, one of the things that I want to point out is that usually this is not a film that is linked to geoengineering or to the human impact on uh, our environment or how the environment is controlled somehow by a human. Um, and, and if we look at it from that perspective, I think that uh, you can connect it to, to, to all these uh, geomedia or geoengineering or geo, um, yeah, geomedia uh, technologies. Um, and yeah, I, I think that uh, Brett uh, was uh, much more creative than I was, but I think I, I, he, he all also puts forward a different view on the, on the film, which I also, uh, Try to try to expose when I think when I think about the a different ending of, for the film or mm -hmm. what would happen if the if if uh, Truman uh, preferred to stay in in this in this uh, this environment mediated environment. Any other comments points for discussion? Um, one thing with um, Charlie, your your um, it was I appreciated being introduced to both of those different films, and I'm kind of in my own practice as an artist, I'm interested in kind of analog materials as a way to kind of um, tie to how we understand representation or how we kind of challenge representation. And I also was sort of thinking about um, the work of Richard Moss. Do you know his work at all? Um, he's, uh, um, he uses the sort of different imaging technologies less um, in this kind of like analog way, but it's very much about that material process kind of impacting how we see any given subject that he's making work about. He kind of, he tends to work in the sort of like the contemporary art space, um, but I just thought um, he would be somebody interesting for you to look at if you weren't already aware of him. It's M-O-S-S-E is the way you spell his last name. Yeah, you you should think for red film. Yeah, so he was using aerochrome film and he used also, um, he did a project um, with kind of heat map um, sort of um, military technology and recently did a project in um, in the Amazon um, and I don't know the specifics of that but each time it's sort of this different imaging technology used in pretty interesting ways. Um, okay so I think we still have two minutes um, but it looks like there's a message from Dan so I'm just checking okay <laughs> uh, yeah yeah go for it. Dominic. Uh, yeah, Charlie. So it's on a um, 
It's a film of quite a different type, but I wondered if you knew Safe by Todd Haynes. You sure. seen that film? Yeah. yeah. Um, your talk just um, put me in mind of it because of the 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 foreboding and the air of dread that suffuses the whole film, and yet mm. the the subject, not the sub, yeah, the subject of that dread, um, the generator is completely invisible. Um, anyway, I was just reminded of it again yeah, well, as a, a film showing what couldn't be seen. You know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Belinda. Thanks. Hi. Um, I just wanted to uh, invite Brett to reflect on his uh, methodology, for want of a better word, and his approach. Um, yeah, it'd just be good to hear more about, uh, I don't know, kind of, kind of an interesting approach in terms of realism and imposing a different kind of realist uh, um, optic on the film. Um, so it would be good to hear if you had a, a, a kind of meta <laughs> dialogue about that. And um, also just considering the fact that in Jaws, the shark was largely, I think, a mechanical shark, if I'm, I might be wrong, but I think that's, yeah. So it's kind of a not, it's a simulation of a shark and, you know, hyper, a hyper shark that accentuates many qualities of sharpness <laughs> so I don't know if you had any thoughts on that either but yeah just be good to hear you reflect on your uh presentation which is really yeah really interesting okay uh thank you uh in terms of method I mean it's funny how it came about I was on holiday swimming in the sea being worried about sharks and then suddenly thought to myself but actually I'm in the sharks space and was thinking about the film Jaws and as the opening line this is the story of my death popped into my head just as I was swimming in the sea, thinking about how would a shark make, how would that shark make sense of that film? And so, yeah, it got me thinking about how, and it's a method I'm wondering about in terms of other films and other narratives. What if you take an animal? What if you did The Wizard of Oz from Toto's point of view? What does that mean? It's just a really long walk. Um, how would that dog make sense of that story? Um, but also kind of really marginal animals that just might pop up for a scene. How might they make sense of that? I've been pondering about actually kind of doing a remake. What if you did Jaws from the shark's point of view? What would that film actually kind of look like? Though as though as the film, the 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 presentation kind of says there's a real problem in terms of kind of recreating the look, the point of view, because that's not how sharks in sensory terms kind of make sense of the world around them. The other thing I suppose I'd reflect on in terms of methodology is the problem of giving a voice to and a longer version of this paper has the shark telling me off for speaking on their behalf and kind of saying what right do you have to say that you can give me a voice that there's a problem in terms of you know giving another a voice which in effect is what this paper is doing and and it's a thing that I think in you know environmental studies and animal studies is constantly a problem. The speaking on behalf of, the giving a voice to, what does that mean? And the power relationships that are always kind of there. Um, in terms of the mechanics of the shark, you're right. Though obviously, for a lot, most of the film, the shark is not seen, which was a deliberate kind of thing because they couldn't get the mechanical shark to work properly, so they ended up not using it until the very end of the film. You're right, it's a mechanical shark, but obviously, narratively, it isn't. And I'm kind of, a, I deliberately picked a kind of fictional film rather than a documentary one, because I'm interested in that way in which fictions, even if they're using, say, kind of mechanical sharks, diegetically are real sharks and clearly inform how we think about real sharks in the real world. So that kind of production component is obviously not part of the film text itself. It's something outside of it. And, you know, there's lots of research talking about the ways in which Jaws has a very significant, had a very significant impact on real world um, understandings and fears of sharks. Um, so, yeah, that kind of fiction diegetic stuff within the film, this is a real shark. Um, and so that's the kind of component I was sort of interested in. But I'm still struggling with that kind of method thing, particularly the speaking on behalf of, which is, which is you know, charged with power relationships and problems. But I haven't worked out an alternative solution. Okay, interesting. Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah, it's a it's an interesting thing, kind of decentering the human in a way, but it also just sort of puts focus on the human in that process. There's a kind of uh, just intriguing tension there with with your process there, Brett. Um, well, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Did you want oh, to no, respond? No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's what I'm, I, I'm wondering. I said I was wondering about a, a remake of the film and a remake of the film would probably be incomprehensible to humans and that and that and 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 there is this question of the extent to which you can only kind of start properly developing ecomedia if we give up the notion that we everything is comprehensible mm -hmm. um and but obviously that doesn't fit within kind of humanist notions of how the world makes sense but yeah obviously that's a power grab in itself saying the world must make sense to us yeah absolutely Is there any other, um, oh yeah, there's just kind of a reflection here by Dom in the chat about um, sort of being proximity to the sea and sort of reflecting on that. Um, so I might, we are, we we can kind of continue the Q&A process if we want, but we're officially now in drinks mode. Um, so, <laughs> If unless there's um, any additional questions, comments, I might just stop the record and then we can, of course, kind of continue to chat um, less formally. So I'll pause here just for a second. Oh, yeah, Charlie. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to add on to something that Dominic said when he was talking about safe. Uh, you know, I was thinking about it as uh, as the conversation went on, and I was just thinking that, that also, I mean, the you know the, the comparison with these films and uh, Safe uh, and also other films that that you know that that take on invisible menaces, uh, stuff like Cat People uh, or that kind of thing, um, is that one of the 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 interesting parts of those films is we're never really sure if the threat actually exists. You know, in, in those representative spaces, in those narrative spaces, the whole, you know, one of the things of safe is that uh, we never really understand if she's completely, you know, if, if it's her having a hallucinate, well, I mean, not hallucinating, but thinking, uh, you know, having some sort of mental breakdown, uh, same, same with cat people, or, you know, those, those things. So, uh, you know, I think that that feeds into a little bit about what I was trying to say as well, is that in the representative uh, space in the way that we understand uh, representative media and those kind of things. Once we once we move to these uh, slow moving or dispersed threats or you know uh, the invisible threats, uh, the representation always ends up with this ambiguity as to whether it exists, whether the invisible exists uh, or not. And so that's sort of part of what I was trying to talk about as well. Just took me a while to formulate my response to Dominique, but yeah. Thanks, Charlie. Okay, all right, well, I'm just gonna stop recording here.